African American experience and the Harlem Renaissance. In this video, we will take a look at the African American experience, responses to the challenges they faced, and the Harlem Renaissance. We will also briefly discuss the experiences of Hispanics, Native, and Asian Americans. The African American Experience You may recall that during World War I, many African Americans moved to the North and Midwest to take jobs in factories after mobilization produced a labor shortage. In the Great Migration, African Americans escaped conditions of sharecropping and segregation in the South and moved to cities like New York, Chicago, Detroit, and Philadelphia. In their new cities, African Americans continued to face racism, discrimination, and in many cases, segregation. The Red Summer Demobilization and the Great Migration had created social tensions. And in 1919, a series of riots motivated by racism and white-on-black violence shocked the country. There were riots in more than 30 cities, with the largest ones taking place in Washington, D.C., Omaha, Nebraska, Chicago, and Elaine, a rural county in Arkansas. In Chicago, for example, an African-American on a raft drifted towards a white beach on Lake Michigan. A white bather on this beach started throwing rocks, hitting him on the head and causing him to drown. When the police refused to arrest anyone, violence broke out and the rioting spread to black neighborhoods as white gangs went in destroying property and assaulting residents. The Chicago riot lasted several days. 38 people were killed and over 500 were injured. The Tulsa Massacre. The Greenwood neighborhood in Tulsa, Oklahoma was a prosperous black community with the largest concentration of black owned businesses in the nation. It was so prosperous that it was popularly known as Black Wall Street. In 1921, one of the worst race riots in the nation's history took place in Tulsa. A 19-year-old African-American was arrested when he fell and grabbed the arm of a white female elevator operator. An angry white crowd gathered at the jail, ready to lynch the young man. But African-American war veterans appeared with their rifles, forcing the crowd to disperse. In response, an armed white mob attacked Greenwood residents and burned most of the neighborhood to the ground. The Rosewood Massacre Rosewood was a self-sufficient, prosperous African-American community close to Gainesville, Florida. Most of the residents worked in the timber industry and nearby turpentine mills. In 1923, a white woman in the nearby town of Sumner claimed that she had been attacked and beaten by an unknown African-American man. Other witnesses, however, claimed that the attacker had in fact been a white railroad worker who was having an affair with the married woman. The county sheriff organized a search party to arrest an escaped prisoner as the probable attacker. After a few violent exchanges, an angry white mob descended on Rosewood burning the town to the ground and killing most of the residents. Some residents hid in nearby swamps for days and were later smuggled out of the area with help from brave whites. The attack was reported by the press, but there were no official records and the massacre was forgotten. In the 1980s, stories told by survivors resurfaced in the media and some survivors even filed for damages from the state. The suit was dropped, but the Florida legislature commissioned an official investigation. Survivors and their descendants 
were awarded $1.5 million in compensation. It was the first time that victims of racial violence were compensated by a state government. Lynchings. On average, 30 black men were lynched per year during the 20s, with a big spike right after the war. Victims were tortured before being murdered, and their dead bodies were often burned or mutilated, as was the case for Will Brown, who was lynched during the Omaha Race Riot. Even though these murders occurred in public, and many times in broad daylight, no one was ever charged under state law. For this reason, legislators with support from the NAACP introduced the Dyer Bill, attempting to make lynching a federal crime. The Dyer Bill passed in the House, but ultimately died on the Senate floor. Three African American Leaders To face their challenges and find opportunities in a society that discriminated against them, three African American leaders offered their vision and plans of action for Black Americans. Booker T. Washington Booker T. Washington was born into slavery in 1856 and died in 1915, five years before the 20s. His ideas, however, were influential and provide the contrast of values, which is a clear theme of this historical period. After much struggle, Booker T. Washington received vocational education, becoming a teacher and later establishing the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, which was focused on teaching agricultural and mechanical skills. He believed that African Americans should concentrate on achieving vocational skills, rather than demanding immediate social equality. In his mind, social equality would come once African Americans demonstrated their honesty, competence, and skills. He suggested the Atlanta Compromise, proposing that African Americans peacefully submit to segregation and white rule in the South in exchange for free vocational training in public schools and basic legal rights. W.E.B. Du Bois W.E.B. Du Bois was a sociology professor and the first African-American to receive a doctorate degree from Harvard. Du Bois strongly disagreed with Booker T. Washington's approach. Instead, he believed that African-Americans should not content themselves with being inferior and should agitate to achieve full social equality and rights at once. According to him, whenever possible, African-Americans should receive liberal and professional education and join the fight for civil rights. To oppose the Atlanta Compromise, Du Bois launched the Niagara Movement, calling for equal economic opportunity and suffrage rights for blacks. He also believed that cooperation with whites was possible and joined New York white progressives to establish the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey was an immigrant from Jamaica who had established the Universal Negro Improvement Association right before moving to Harlem. Garvey firmly believed that African Americans should celebrate and take pride in their African heritage and acknowledge that black is beautiful instead of trying to fit into European patterns of beauty. Garvey believed that cooperations with white was not possible and opposed Du Bois' views and the NAACP. He insisted that African Americans should learn to be independent from whites and set up their own businesses. Garvey himself was a businessman and set up a shipping line and a black newspaper. Garvey started a Back to Africa movement and even proclaimed himself Provisional President of Africa. After facing financial failure and a scandal after meeting Klan leaders, 
Garvey also faced a jail sentence for mail fraud and deportation in 1927. His movement lost momentum and never recovered, but his ideas and their influence did not die and would re-emerge during the civil rights movement of the 60s. The Harlem Renaissance During the 1920s, the Harlem neighborhood in New York City was home to a vibrant African-American community. Because of housing discrimination, Harlem became home to African-Americans of all classes, income levels, and professions. At the time, there were about 15 million African-Americans in the United States. Many of them had moved into cities, receiving better education and opportunities than their parents ever had. African-American communities and organizations started their own newspapers and magazines with readership reaching 300,000 subscribers for the Chicago Defender or 10,000 for the Pittsburgh Courier. Black newspapers and magazines were crucial to create a feeling of community and develop a sense of pride by publishing news and editorials, as well as the works of many African American writers and poets. The result would be a cultural black movement without precedent in the United States the Harlem Renaissance. An early influence of the Harlem Renaissance was Alan Locke, a philosophy professor at Howard University, a historic black college in Washington, D.C. Locke published Enter the New Negro, an essay rejecting the timidity and subservience of past black generations and calling for African Americans to embrace the new Negro identity. Men and women who take pride in being black and rise above discrimination and racism. Poet Langston Hughes captured the essence of the movement and the spirit of the race in his poems, inspiring a generation of African Americans. Zora Neale Hurston studied anthropology in Columbia and published several influential novels and short stories portraying African-American struggles. Other figures included writers County Cullen, Jean Toomer, Claude McKay, and painters Archibald Motley, Palmer Hayden, and Aaron Douglas. Jazz music as a black cultural expression encompassed the spirit and dilemmas of the 20s. At night, New Yorkers flocked to the famous Cotton Club in Harlem, where black musicians played for white audiences. Black musicians like Louis Armstrong, Cab Calloway, and Duke Ellington gained fame, along with jazz vocalists Ella Fitzgerald, Billie Holiday, and Bessie Smith. Soon, jazz music was popular throughout the country, thanks to F. Scott Fitzgerald's books and motion pictures. Other Minority Groups During World War I, Mexican immigration increased significantly to fill in the labor shortages in agriculture. This wave of immigration found nativist opposition in many states. Congress, however, refused to set limits on Latin American immigration. Instead, they created the Border Patrol and required a $10 visa to enter the country. Since most immigrants could not afford the fee, they began crossing the border illegally. In 1918, Octaviano Larrazolo became New Mexico's governor and then the first Hispanic American in the U.S. Senate in 1928. Native Americans continued to be limited to live in reservations and forced to assimilate on the terms of the Dawes Act. In reservations, Native Americans were not receiving adequate education or health services and faced many social problems, like extreme poverty, alcoholism, crime, and suicide. 
Native American war veterans received citizenship at the end of World War I. But in 1924, the Indian Citizenship Act made all Native Americans U.S. citizens. Natives continued their resistance with aims to assert their identity and avoid further loss of land. With the exception of Filipinos, Asians had been completely banned from immigrating to the U.S. Asians living in the U.S. could not become citizens. They often faced discrimination and segregation, especially in the West Coast. In the 1920s, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the immigration ban on Asians, as well as laws that prevented them from owning land or segregated them in public schools. Thank you for watching. Please click like and subscribe for more videos.